Hello, this is Pastor Patrick Hines, and I want to do another installment of Jay Gresham Machen's wonderful book, uh, Christianity and Liberalism, and uh, I'll pull up the text here uh, for you. I'm kind of under the gun here. I, I want to. I wanted to get a podcast in because uh, uh, folks have, have said that the, the stuff reading Machen has been really helpful to them. So I wanted to go ahead and do that. If this will work, why is this not working? Hello, uh, it's looking at it. Oh, it's looking at Chrome. Uh, I'm going to point this at the Kindle, my Kindle app. There it is. And then do this. That work? Hello. Hello. There it is. Okay. We're ready to rock and roll now. Um, so I'm just going to pick up. I always just highlight the last word we did. Uh, let me uh, do this so you can, so it will fit the screen a little better. Okay. There we go. All right. Now we finished off last time uh, talking about how so many of the proponents of liberalism have tried to say that Jesus was just a nice guy who was an ethical teacher and um, all that stuff that uh, liberals still say and still do today. Um, and so Machen continues on here um, after pointing out that Jesus was very much conscious of who he was and he, he did understand the nature of his mission and so, so on and so forth. And uh, I love how he ends here. We end, ended here last time uh, talking about H.G. Wells. Mr. Wells may find it edifying to associate Jesus with Confucius in a brotherhood of beneficent vagueness, but what ought to be clearly understood is that such a Jesus has nothing to do with history. He is a purely imaginary figure, a symbol and not a fact. Now what's Machen alluding to here? The fact that the Apostle Paul himself says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that there were other Jesuses. And this is what's so important uh, for the American church today is that the name Jesus doesn't really mean much and the doctrines of scripture don't mean much unless they're defined according to the word of God. Uh, people make up Jesuses that they like better than the one who is real, um, but making them up doesn't make them exist. Okay, uh, as Machen says, the, the Jesus of the Socinians, of the liberals, doesn't exist. He's, he is a figment of their imagination. He is a purely imaginary figure, a symbol, not a fact. And then he continues. Others, more seriously, have recognized the existence of the problem, but have sought to avoid it by denying that Jesus ever thought that he was the Messiah, and by supporting their denial, not by mere assertions, but by a critical examination of the sources. Such was the effort, for example, of W. Reed, and a brilliant effort it was, but it has resulted in failure. The messianic consciousness of Jesus is not merely rooted in the sources considered as documents, but it lies at the very basis of the whole edifice of the church. If, as J. Weiss has pertinently said, the disciples before the crucifixion had merely been told that the kingdom of God was coming, if Jesus had really kept altogether in the background his own part in the kingdom, then why, when despair finally gave place to joy, did the disciples not merely say, despite Jesus' death, the kingdom that he foretold will truly come? Why did they say, rather, despite his death, he is the Messiah? From no point of view, then, can the fact be denied that Jesus did claim to be the Messiah, neither from the point of view of acceptance of the gospel witness as a whole, nor from the point of view of modern naturalism. And when the gospel account of Jesus is considered closely, it is found to involve the messianic consciousness throughout even those parts of the Gospels which have been regarded as most purely ethical are found to be based altogether upon Jesus' lofty claims. The Sermon on the Mount is a striking example. It is the fashion now to place the Sermon on the Mount in contrast with the rest of the New Testament. We will have nothing to do with theology, men say in effect. We will have nothing to do with miracles, with atonement, or with heaven, or with hell. For us, the golden rule is a sufficient guide of life. In the simple principles of the Sermon on the Mount, we discover a solution of all the problems of society, end quote. And just breaking from the quotation, uh, that was something I heard a lot when I was an undergrad. Uh, there were a couple people at that church I went to there that they just didn't care about theology, they didn't care about the cross and all that. They just, when you talk to them, there was a guy, his name was Lloyd. Uh, he's, probably, he's probably dead now. He was very old, uh, even back then. This has been, you know... 27 years ago um, he would just say well you know as long as you obey the golden rule as long as you believe in the golden rule and try to do the golden rule you're you're good 
And so that's something I heard, uh, even in my lifetime. You know, I know Machen was hearing that all the time 100 years ago from the liberals, but I've heard that myself, and I'm sure many of you have heard the same thing. Machen goes on here. Here's his response to that attitude. It is indeed rather strange that men can speak in this way. Certainly it is rather derogatory to Jesus to assert that never except in one brief part of his recorded words did he say anything that is worthwhile. <laughs> That's a good point. If you're going to say, well, we just like the red letters in the Sermon on the Mount, um, it's like there's a, lot, there's a lot more red letters. There's a lot more that Jesus said recorded in the Gospels. Think about John 14, 15, 16, and 17. There you have the, the upper room discourse, the, the most in-depth treatise on the Holy Spirit in John 14, 15, 16. His high priestly prayer in John 17 and all the other things he did. All the parables, the kingdom parables, Matthew 13, Luke uh, 14 and 15, all the parables. I mean, there's a lot more stuff that Jesus said than just the Sermon on the Mount. Machen makes a good point there. Um, it, it's derogatory. It's insulting to the Lord to act like he only said a few things that are even worthwhile, that are worth taking a look at. He continues on here, but even in the Sermon on the Mount, there is far more than some men suppose. Men say that it contains no theology. In reality, it contains theology of the most stupendous kind. And I just want to break from the quotation. I preached a whole bunch of sermons, um, a, a, a sermon each on the Beatitudes, the opening verses of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, those, those uh, Beatitudes. Those are a gold mine. In fact, Thomas Watson Watson's book, The Beatitudes, was a was so good it was it was life altering. It was a life altering book to read. I learned so much about the character of God and about the Christian life from really going deep into the Beatitudes, the, those uh, statements of blessedness, because they're they're truly wonderful. Okay, in particular, it contains the loftiest possible presentation of Jesus's own person. That presentation appears in the strange note of authority which pervades the whole discourse. It appears in the recurrent words, but I say unto you. Now, just breaking from the quotation, it would have been better if Machen had added, Jesus would quote something from the Old Testament. You have heard that it was said, but I say unto you. And so Jesus is claiming the highest authority here. And it's not that he's contradicting those things. He's pointing out errors in Pharisaic understanding of it. That's what he's doing in all those. Machen goes on here. Jesus plainly puts his own words on an equality with what he certainly regarded as the divine words of scripture. He claimed the right to legislate for the kingdom of God. Let it not be objected that this note of authority involves merely a prophetic consciousness in Jesus, a mere right to speak in God's name as God's spirit might lead. For what prophet ever spoke in this way? The prophet said, Thus saith the Lord. But Jesus said, I say. Okay, now just breaking from the quotation here. That the significance of that cannot be overstated. The prophets did not speak in their own name. You know, Jeremiah, when he was called, he was told, By God, I will put my words in your mouth. When Isaiah spoke, he said, Thus saith Yahweh. When, when all the other prophets spoke, they recognized and stated repeatedly that they were not speaking for themselves, they were speaking for the Lord. And Jesus speaks directly for himself because he is the Lord. Machen goes on here. We have no mere prophet here. No mere humble exponent of the will of God. Now, why, why is Machen emphasizing this? Because people want to say, oh, he was a great man. He was a great teacher. A great prophet. And certainly, he was all of those things, but not merely those things. He's much more than that. Think about what he's saying. I say unto you. Okay? No mere humble exponent of the will of God, but a stupendous person speaking in a manner which for any other person would be abominable and absurd. Okay, just FYI, just remember, when the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests, they sent people to go get Jesus, and he, they were supposed to bring Jesus back to them, and all that these people could say in response was, no one ever talked like this man. There was something about the authority with which he spoke that astounded people. Machen goes on here. The same thing appears in the passage in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Listen to this. I mean, this passage, you have Jesus claiming to be the one who either allows or denies entrance into heaven. Okay, no prophet could ever say, no mere prophet could ever say that. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out demons, and in thy name done many mighty works? And then I shall confess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work lawlessness. This passage is in some respects a favorite with modern liberal teachers, for it is interpreted falsely, it is true, yet plausibly, as meaning that all that a man needs to attain standing with God is an approximately right performance of his duties to his fellow men, and not any assent to a creed or any direct relation to Jesus. But have those who quote the passage so triumphantly in this way ever stopped to reflect upon the other side of the picture? Upon the stupendous fact that in this same passage, the eternal destinies of men are made dependent upon the word of Jesus? Jesus here represents himself as seated on the judgment seat of all the earth, separating whom he will forever from the bliss that is involved in being present with him. Could anything be further removed from such a Jesus, from the humble teacher of righteousness appealed to by modern liberalism? Clearly, it is impossible to escape from theology, even in the chosen precincts of the Sermon on the Mount. A stupendous theology, with Jesus' own person at the center of it, is the presupposition of the whole teaching. Okay, now, that's an understatement. But everything Machen just said here is right. You want to claim, well, we just like the, the ethical teachings and the, the high moral standards of Jesus. You're not reading the Sermon on the Mount closely enough, then. The stupendous person who speaks in a manner that would be absurd and abominable for any mere human to speak in. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you, whether or not you end up in heaven depends upon my word, whether I let you in or not. I mean, that's, that is... How can people miss that? Well, familiarity familiarity with it they've heard it their whole lives they, they miss the punch the force of that it's a good exercise to go through i encourage you to do this when you read scripture try to imagine what you would think it means and try to imagine how it would affect you were you to be hearing it for the very first time and that's one thing i do a lot because you read and reread the same passages don't let familiarity take away how astounding and how glorious and how amazing the word of god really is I gotta love that. Four four o'clock coffee. Okay. But may not that theology still be removed? May we not get rid of the bizarre theological element which has intruded itself even into the Sermon on the Mount and content ourselves merely with the ethical portion of the discourse? The question from the point of view of modern liberalism is natural, but it must be answered with an emphatic negative. For the fact is that the ethic of the discourse taken by itself will not work at all. The golden rule furnishes an example. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Is that rule a rule of universal application? Will it really solve all the problems of society? A little experience shows that such is not the case. Help a drunkard to get rid of his evil habit, and you will soon come to distrust the modern interpretation of the golden rule. The trouble is that the drunkard's companions apply the rule only too well. They do unto him exactly what they would have him do unto them by buying him a drink. The golden rule becomes a powerful obstacle in the way of moral advance. But the trouble does not lie in the rule itself. It lies in the modern interpretation of the rule. The error consists in supposing that the golden rule with the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is addressed to the whole world. As a matter of fact... The whole discourse is expressly addressed to Jesus' disciples. And from them, the great world outside is distinguished in the plainest possible way. The persons to whom the golden rule is addressed are persons in whom a great change has been wrought. A change which fits them for entrance into the kingdom of God. Such persons will have pure desires. They, and they only, can safely do unto others as they would have others do unto them. For the things that they would have others do unto them are high and pure. So it is with the whole of a discourse. The new law of the Sermon on the Mount in itself can only produce despair. Strange indeed is the complacency 
with which modern men can say that the golden rule and the high ethical principles of Jesus are all they need. In reality, if the requirements for entrance into the kingdom of God are what Jesus declares them to be, we are all undone. We have not even attained to the external righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. And how shall we attain to that righteousness of the heart which Jesus demands? The Sermon on the Mount, rightly interpreted then, makes man a seeker after some divine means of salvation by which entrance into the kingdom can be obtained. Even Moses was too high for us. But before this higher law of Jesus, who shall stand without being condemned? The Sermon on the Mount, like all the rest of the New Testament, really leads a man straight to the foot of the cross. Man, I love Jake Russell Machen. I would love to have met this guy. What was he pointing out? The ethical content of the Sermon on the Mount is not good news. The law of God, taken by itself, away from the person and the work and the cross of Christ, the law is not good news. Paul said it in Romans 4.15. The law brings about wrath. Romans 3.19. We know that whatever the law says, including the sections of the Sermon on the Mount that address the law, what it really means, that adultery is not just a prohibition of the act, but the thoughts, the lusts. The prohibition against murder is not just a prohibition against actually killing people. It's also against hating people without a cause. And all the rest of them. You can do that with all the commandments. Not coveting doesn't mean merely not wanting what your neighbor has. It also forbids any discontentment whatsoever about anything ever. The law of God separated from the theology, from the gospel of Jesus Christ. The law is not good news. People want to say, hey, as long as you believe the golden rule and live by the golden rule, you're, you're good to go. No one has ever lived out the golden rule. Never. Except one. Jesus of Nazareth. The Sermon on the Mount, like as Machen said, like all the rest of the New Testament, really leads a man straight to the foot of the cross. And I would say this to liberals and to the progressives and the PCA and anyone else that listens to this podcast or watches this on YouTube. If you don't understand that part, if you don't understand that the Bible condemns the human race to hell forever. If you don't understand that, you're not going to understand the essence of who Jesus is at all. If you don't understand that part, that the law is not your friend, that the moral components of biblical revelation are not your friend, that they bring about the wrath of God on you, because every mouth is shut and the whole world is guilty before God, and therefore we all need Christ, if you haven't been led to the foot of the cross by everything that the scriptures teaches, then you haven't read the scriptures correctly. Now Machen goes on here. Even the disciples to whom the teaching of Jesus was first addressed knew well that they needed more than guidance in the way that they should go. It is only a superficial reading of the Gospels that can find in the relation which the disciples sustained to Jesus a mere relation of pupil to master. When Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, he was speaking not as a philosopher calling pupils to his school, but as one who was in possession of rich stores of divine grace. And this much at least the disciples knew. They knew well in their heart of hearts that they had no right to stand in the kingdom. They knew that only Jesus could win them entrance there. They did not yet know fully how Jesus could make them children of God, but they did know that he could do it, and he alone. And in that trust, all the theology of the great Christian creeds was in expectation contained. At this point, an objection may arise. May we not, the modern liberal will say, may we not now return to that simple trust of the disciples? May we not cease to ask how Jesus saves? May we not simply leave the way to him? What need is there then of defining effectual calling? What need of enumerating justification, adoption, and sanctification, and the several benefits which in this life do either accompany or flow from them? What need even of rehearsing the steps in the saving work of Christ as they were rehearsed by the Jerusalem church? What need of saying that, 
Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he has been raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Should not our trust be in a person rather than in a message? In Jesus rather than in what Jesus did? In Jesus' character rather than in Jesus' death? You know, I went to a, a doctor recently. I had to, um, I was having a problem. I had some, uh, um, some growths on the back of my head I had removed a few years ago. And this guy was a really nice Christian man, and he was kind of disillusioned with, you know, reformed Christianity. He said, man, those people love their, they love their doctrine more than their Christ. <laughs> and I went, I said, what Christ are you talking about? You said they love their doctrine more than their Christ. I said, you can't have Christ without doctrine. So if you don't have a doctrine of Christ, then you don't have Christ at all. You have to know which Jesus you're talking about. And that takes theology. That takes doctrine. They love their, they love their doctrine more than their Jesus. You know who else says things like that? Steve Schlissel. Schlissel. Oh, it doesn't matter. We're, you know, It's not about propositions. It's about Jesus. I don't, I don't want propositions about Christ. I want Christ. That is a false dichotomy if there ever was one. Okay, don't don't give me all this theology about Jesus. I just want to know Jesus. You can't know Jesus without theology. If you want to even talk about who Jesus is, um, what good is it without talking about what he's like, about his character? You know, there's another thing coming up here in the, in Machen's book, which hopefully we'll eventually get to it. Um, Machen says that the thing. Let me put a bookmark here and uh, um, let's see where are we? Yeah, I'll, I'll mark this. I'm going to find this quotation. Um, bristling. Yeah, there it is. Ha <laughs> ha, found it. Cool. I love Kindles. It's so cool. You can just look things up. All right. This is later on, and but I wanted to read this quotation because I remember reading this for the first time. It was so helpful. Listen to this. Okay, before I read the quotation, imagine, let's say, right when I met Amy, my wife, the, the girl that I proposed to and, and married almost 25 years ago, what if I came up to you and was just rhapsodizing about love, singing the many splendors of love? I have met the woman of my dreams. I have met the woman of my dreams. I love her so much. And I'm going to marry her. I'm going to marry her. But what if you said, well, that's great, Patrick. What, can you tell me about her? Oh, I don't know anything about her. I don't want to know anything about her. I just want to know her. Wouldn't you think that that's really weird? It's Listen to Machen here. Um, let's see, where should I start the quotation here? All right. It has been observed in the last chapter that Christianity is based on an account of something that happened in the first century of our era. But before that account can be received, certain pre presuppositions must be accepted. The Christian gospel consists in an account of how God saved man, and before that gospel can be understood, something must be known about God and about man. The doctrine of God and the doctrine of man are the two great presuppositions of the gospel. With regard to these presuppositions, as with regard to the gospel itself, modern liberalism is diametrically opposed to Christianity. Now listen to this part very carefully. It is opposed to Christianity in the first place in its conception of God. But at this point we are met with a particularly insistent form of that objection to doctrinal matters which has already been considered. It is unnecessary, we are told, to have a conception of God Theology, or the knowledge of God, it is said, is the death of religion. We should not seek to know God, but should merely feel his presence. With regard to this objection, it ought to be observed that if religion consists merely in feeling the presence of God, it is devoid of any moral quality whatever. Pure feeling, if there be such a thing, is non-moral. What makes affection, now listen to this very carefully, listen to how incisive this guy is. What makes affection for a human friend, for example, such an ennobling thing, is the knowledge which we possess of the character of our friend. Let me read that again. What makes affection for a human friend, for example, such an ennobling thing, such a wonderful thing, is the knowledge which we possess of the character of our friend. Human affection, apparently so simple, is really just bristling with dogma, with doctrine. He says, 
It depends upon a host of observations treasured up in the mind with regard to the character of our friends. I mean, think about this. If, you, if you're married and you, you really love your spouse, why do you love them? Because of the doctrines about them. The observations that you have of who they are. Their character. What they're like. Who they are as a person. It depends upon a host of observations treasured up in the mind with regard to the character of our friends. But if human affection is thus really dependent upon knowledge, why should it be otherwise with that supreme personal relationship which is at the basis of religion? Why should we be indignant about slanders directed against a human friend while at the same time we are patient about the basest slanders directed against our God? Okay, so break from the quotation here for a minute. If you're married, you're engaged, you're a man, and you adore this woman, what, how would it affect you if someone started spreading slanderous rumors about the character of your fiancé or your wife? Started just saying scandalously false things, things that you knew were not true about her. Would you get upset about that? You know, the, the revoice debacle in the PCA? The, I told... Men in Westminster Presbytery, this makes me a thousand times more angry than if someone slandered my wife. And I am disgusted and shocked that so many guys, they're just quiet. We'll, you know, we'll wait and see what the court says. We'll, we'll wait and see what, you know, what the findings of the committee are. These people are lying about Jesus Christ. They are lying about the efficacy of his ability to liberate people from sin. They are lying about him. Nobody seems to get mad. What if someone lied about your best friend? What if someone lied about your wife and said gross, disgusting, scandalous things? Well, I just want to understand where you're coming from. Of course not. You would react with, with some passion about that, wouldn't you? Why not have even more passion about the one who loved you and gave his life to save you? Listen to Machen again. Why should we be indignant about slanders directed against a human friend while at the same time, we're patient about the basest slanders directed against our God. What, what the liberals say about Jesus is false. What the liberals, what the progressives say about God is false. They are slandering God in the things they say about him. They're lying about Jesus and his life-changing power. That, that upsets me. That makes me indignant. More indignant than people doing the same thing about my best friends. Or my kids or my wife. Certainly, it does make the greatest possible difference what we think about God. The knowledge of God is the very basis of religion. And dear listeners, that's why God gave us this. The Bible. That's why he gave us verbs, nouns, adjectives, sentences. So that we could distinguish between who's telling us the truth and who's lying to us. We can go to the text of God's word. We can know the character of God based on what he says. Not, not on how we feel, but based on what he has spoken, what God has said. All right. I think that's a good place to stop. Um, let me go back. Where was I? Uh, i got to find where I left off here. Okay, there it is. Okay, so we'll pick it up uh, where we left off last time. But thank you all for watching or for listening.